Let's go to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew. Um, we must understand that God is so vast. God is so vast, and that's why the Bible had to be very prophetic. And if you take a good look at the subject of prayer, you'll find God is viewed with certain metaphors. There are certain metaphors presented in Scripture uh, that reveals aspects of God. Prayer is a vast enterprise. And in order for us to be adequately educated on the subject of prayer, we will need to explore scripture to find all the metaphors that were used to depict God because the rules of engagement differ for each metaphor that was used to depict God. For instance, in the book of Matthew that I asked you to open to, God, Matthew chapter 6, God is seen through the lens of the metaphor father. Are you with me? Stay with me. Stay with me. And now, now that I know that it's, it's God's will for me to be coming again and again to Manchester. In fact, I'm a member of Prayer Storm. Where's, where's, where's Jane? Oh, it's okay. So, I'll be coming by God's good grace year after year to build on the subject of prayer because the move of God that he is about to introduce has a mighty tank of prayer attached to it. So each functionary in the kingdom must be educated, adequately educated on the subject of prayer. So I asked you to open the book of Matthew chapter 6 because... In Matthew chapter 6, God is seen through the lens of the metaphor called Father. The rules of engagement in prayer, if we see God as Father, is different from another metaphor. Are you there? Are you following me? Because in the book of Luke chapter 18 verse 1, we see God in the light of another metaphor. In Luke chapter 18, verse number 1, the Bible says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. You see, Jesus is about to present to us a parable here. All right? And normally, when a parable is presented, the lesson that is to be drawn from the parable is drawn at the end of the piece. But in the book of Luke, chapter 18, verse 1, Jesus places the lesson before the parable to show us um, how urgently he wants us to, to come into the understanding for which he is willing to tell the parable. And he spake a parable to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Now, this scripture is revealing the way we were designed. We were designed as creatures of prayer. We were designed to survive by prayer. We were designed to get by by prayer. That means you pray when you are broke, you pray when you are sick, you pray when you are in prison, you pray when it is snowing, you pray when you are thirsty, you pray when you, when you get sacked from the office, you pray when you are promoted, you pray when you get pregnant, you pray when you, are, you can't get pregnant, you pray that men ought always. That's the design. But unfortunately, a lot of us have this also designed methods of surviving without having to pray. And, and any method you designed, any method you invented 
for surviving on the face of the earth without having to pray. That method that you invented is called malfunctioning. You are not operating according to design. That your state of existence is a malfunctioning state of existence. Because your life doesn't reveal what is in the original prescription for man. And he spake a parable. That's, why, that's one of the reasons why we need to begin to fan the flames of the subject of prayer again in the body of Christ. We have, we have devised strategies, so many strategies. In fact, in some quarters, in some quarters, there are no more prayer meetings in the local church. Prayer meetings are now strategy sessions for strategy. Meanwhile, the Bible says that he speak a parable to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Uh, the second thing that is in that scripture is that, are you with me? What's the opposite of prayerful? Prayerless, okay. I just want to announce to us that the word prayerless is not in the Bible, the entire Bible, because I read it from back to back. That word is not there. The opposite of prayerful is not prayerless. It is it's fainting. You are, you, you are either praying or you are what? Fainting. Because men ought always to pray and not to faint. So if you are not praying, you are in a state of fainting. That's your strategy that you designed, you invented to, to make you escape prayer. You have short-circuited prayer out of your ecosystem. That state of existence that you sustain now, apart from prayer, is a situation of existing on, on life support. You are fainting. You, you are fainting. There. You know, when I come next, we'll talk about Africa. And how that in order for you to survive as a Christian, you would need to learn how to inhale prayer with the same ease with which you inhale oxygen. In some quarters, in some quarters. That's the explanation of the condition. Because of the, the presence of witchcraft, demonic spirits and warlocks that know how to wield the scepters of darkness. You will, you will wake up. You will wake up because there is, there is, uh, the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. <laughs> so you've been surviving on life support because you were designed to be a creature of prayer. You are a personality that is designed to function in priesthood. But you see, what I want to do tonight is to explain some fundamental things in prayer and give us the opportunity to practice. In the book of Luke chapter 18 that I asked you to open, are you still, are you still with me? Now, I don't have a, a, a clock here. I'm wondering how I'm going to tell the time. Okay. Now, James, if it's uh, like um, 20 minutes for me to go, just do something like this. Okay. And then I will, I will know what that means. Now, if we go to Luke chapter 18, beginning from verse 2, you will notice that the metaphor that was used to depict God in the book of Luke chapter 18 is a judge. You see, a praying in the context where God sits as a judge has, is a bit different. The texture of that engagement is different from when God sits in the capacity of father. Is somebody following what I'm talking about here? The texture of that engagement is different. And part of what we want to do is to educate everyone in every realm of prayer so that you will know how to take your journey and how to respond when situations begin to work against you. You will know what you need to do in order to change it. Life is supernatural. The spirit realm, the heavenlies were created. The heavenlies were created before the earthly. 
the invincible was created bef before the visible. In fact, I don't have time to take us to the book of Genesis to play with a few Hebrew words, and you'll find that in actual construction, in actual construction, the visible realm uh, derives from the invincible. So if we want to manipulate the visible, for instance, we don't need to come into the visible. We can manipulate the visible from the invincible because that's where its foundation is based. Every tree has roots. If you want to kill the tree, don't forget about the leaves. Just go to the root. You will kill the tree. Every house has its foundation. If we have a way of compromising the foundation, then you don't need, it doesn't matter how tall the house is. It will fall like a pack of cards once there is compromise in its foundation. This physical existence derives from the invincible, intangible dimensions. And except we are trained to master these invincible and intangible dimensions, we are going to be victims of people that understand the art. Are you there? Yes. Yeah. So if there is, are, are you with me? You know the Bible says that the people that do know their God, and it didn't say the people that do know Jehovah, it said their God. They shall be strong and they shall do exploits. It means that if someone knows the God of thunder, if someone knows Poseidon, and he knows him well, he will be strong. He will be able to do exploits because he has an edge. There is, there is a spiritual being, a spiritual entity that is backing him up. If you stand with him and there's crisis between you and him, <laughs> he will launch at you with the power that he has secured from the invincible dimension. And that is the thing about priesthood. Your strength is dependent on whether or not you know your God. And the knowledge of God is not intellectual. The knowledge of God is experiential. So if you do not practice prayer, there is no way you can know God. No way you can know God. And it will also interest you to know as much as I desire that every believer in Jesus Christ be a master of scriptures. It is possible for you to know scriptures intellectually and not know God. Even though in order for us to judge things in the spirit, you need to be very, very competent in your knowledge of the word of God. It gives us the capacity to design, to probe, to decipher, all right, so that our journey in the Spirit will be guided indeed by the Holy Ghost. Are you with me? But it is possible for you to know the Bible. I've seen theologians that are not born again, master theologians, brilliant theologians that are not born again. But in terms of lecturing, salvation, sanctification, transformation. They are master lecturers. They can bring knowledge, but they do not have any experience of the things that they speak about. In the book of Luke chapter 18, we see that God is a judge. So God is seen as a judge in the book of Luke chapter 18. And if we're going to talk about dealing with God and dealing with his justice system in prayer, it's a different ball game altogether. You will need to be educated in order to uh, deploy uh, your arsenal in that direction. In the book of Luke chapter number 11, uh, God is seen in the little parable that Jesus told as a friend. Are you there? So the rules of engagement on that platform is also different. So this is the elementary, the preliminary scope of the foundation of prayer that I'll be laying. Anytime I come, we'll continue from where we stop. Anytime I come, we'll continue. So the education uh, keeps building, and for every session that we do the theory, we will endeavor to do the practical, because the kingdom of God is not in words. So let's go to the book of Matthew now. Matthew Chapter number six. 
Are you there in Matthew chapter number 6? All right. We'll look at verse 9 briefly. Matthew 6, 9. Just briefly. Then we'll take one point and then we'll switch to the practicals. If you're still here, say amen. amen. All right. He say, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, our Father, which art in heaven. These are basic information that you need to understand the context of your enterprise in your labors in prayer. Now, our Father is domiciled in heaven. Are you there? Is domiciled where? Amen. I, I hope you know you cannot arrive at heaven in the flesh because you are not in heaven. You are in Manchester. <laughs> All right, so it's not our Father in Manchester, our Father which art in heaven. Now, so what you are doing in prayer is reaching a personality in heaven. And it happens to be that the only possible outlet for you to encounter a being in heaven is through his spirit. So if the spirit of God does not quicken you, as the psalmist realized in the book of Psalms 80 verse 18, because David was he that said, so we will not depart from thee. Quicken us and we shall call upon thy name. The reason why we need to be quickened by God. You can be, hey, are you still here? Yes. You can start prayer because according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you can, the, your ability to pray in tongues is the only gift of the spirit that you can operate at will. Your ability to pray in tongues. Okay, so you can decide to pray in tongues because the Bible says, I will pray in the spirit, will and I will pray in my understanding also. So just like you can decide to pray in your understanding, you can also decide to pray in the spirit. Now, you see, the idea of praying in the spirit, okay, I begin with my will. That means I start the journey with mechanical energy. The reason why I'm running with mechanical energy is because God has given us the authority given the fact that dunamis, which is the word that is used to describe the investment that God made in our recreated human spirit that gives us the ability and the capacity to pray in the spirit, to exercise our spirit. Do you understand that? Now, so, uh, it's just like my phone. I have, I have a Samsung phone there, and I have some applications that are installed on my phone. You see, I got them from Google Store, but they are installed on my phone right now. And I don't need to apply to Google to get permission to use the application that is on my phone, even though I got it from Google. Are you there? That's how dunamis is, dunamis. Uh, the power of God was installed in your recreated human spirit. So you don't need to take permission from heaven to use the software. So you can decide to pray in the spirit at will. Are you there? Now, so when you begin to exercise your spirit and you begin to pray at will, some point in the adventure, the Holy Spirit is going to take the responsibility of the process from you. And that's the experience that the psalmist had for which he said, quicken us and we shall call upon thy name. It means that you are not going to travel you are not going to travel and have encounters and participate with him that is of heaven except you are quickened by the Holy Ghost. So when we start praying, when I start praying in tongues, I, I start, I, it takes me like 45 minutes, 50 minutes for the gear, the prayer gear to, to shift. When the prayer gear shifts, it means you have arrived at a place called the point of prayer. 
You know, there's a difference between the point of prayer and the prayer point. The point of prayer is that point where you are no longer responsible for providing the energy that drives the prayer wheel. The mechanical energy gives way to kinetic energy. The, the, the dynamo begins to operate. So it has inherent capacity to keep itself consistent in the oscillatory activity. You, you don't know generators. You, you don't use generators, so you don't know. Okay. In Africa, we have one generator called Tiger, Tiger Generator. Do I have a witness? Someone knows Tiger. So if you want to get Tiger to start running, it, there's a mechanical lever that is attached to the generator. So you just need to hold the lever and then you, are, you, you pull on it. As long as you can get the dynamo to oscillate maximally, it, it takes the responsibility of subsequent oscillations from you. From the mechanical, it becomes kinetic. So when you begin to pray in tongues, it starts mechanically. Don't worry about the me mechanical start. You can even, uh, Satan can even deceive you to think that you are not doing anything. You are not making any progress. It is just a drag. Yes, mechanical energy is like that. But the reason why you are pressing mechanically, pressing with your will, paddling your prayer canoe, you are paddling it deliberately. The reason why you are doing that is because you, are, you have an expectation that at some point this Holy Ghost will come and quicken you and take up the responsibility of driving the spiritual activity from your hands. Exactly. So that point where you experience the switch from your efforts to his efforts, that point is called the prayer point. The point of what? prayer. It is when you arrive at the point of prayer, are you there? The Holy Spirit begins to drive the system. Even though you came with two items to pray about, at the point of prayer, the system can sustain itself. So the system begins to produce prayer points. Even though you came with your own. Are you, are you with? The, the system ignores your, your list. And the system can, if you are faithful to the system, your list can be ignored for seven days. Maybe it's the seventh day that the system now picks up an item on your list. If you decide not to flow with the system and you decide to insist on your list, you, you are cut off from that flow. And then you get back to mechanical energy. So the psalmist says, so shall we not depart from thee quicken us and we shall call upon thy name the reason why you need to be quickened is because the person you are engaging is our father who at what you will need heavenly energy to engage a man of heaven and so the holy ghost comes to quicken you and when you are quickened the process of prayer is no longer predicated on your own natural ability to push but the inbuilt capacity that is linked to the investment, the spiritual investment, the spiritual capital that God has made available in your spirit. It, it begins to run on that capacity. That's why two hours is the same as seven hours is the same as 14 hours. As long as the system is still operational, you can just, do you understand what I'm talking about? You will be in the presence of God for as long as it will take to prosecute a matter that is hanging in the spirit for which God wants you to attend to. And it will not be by your own energy. It will be by his energy. So, so why, can, why will I risk fainting when God has provided for my adventure in the spirit? Please help me tell your neighbor, I choose not to faint. <laughs> All right, two points I need to bring to your notice quickly before we go to the practical session. Pastor James is supposed to be my... Okay, I'm still good, all right. Okay. 
Okay, let's just jump to uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And we'll, we'll just take a reading. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. That's the lecture. That's the reading for the night. The first thing that we need to define is who a prayer hypocrite is. Because Jesus raises the issue of hypocrisy on the subject of prayer. If you read from the book of Matthew chapter 6 beginning from verse 1, you are going to see a given hypocrite. We have a given hypocrite. He now also mentions that there is a prayer hypocrite and he also mentions that there is a fasting hypocrite. But because our emphasis is prayer, I will not be touching the others. We will just like to find out who is a prayer hypocrite. It is possible for all of your prayer intentions to end at hypocrisy. And that's why Jesus is saying, just in case, just in case you have an intention to be a prayerful person, make sure you avoid becoming a hypocrite. So we need to define who a prayer hypocrite is so that you avoid it. That's the first obstacle that every prayer man, every prayer woman has to avoid is the possibility of ending up becoming a prayer what? Hypocrite. The definition of a prayer hypocrite is in, in the context of who the father is as revealed in these two verses of scripture. The Bible says that the prayer hypocrite likes to pray standing in the synagogues. He likes to pray standing in the corner of the streets to be seen by men. That's the problem with the hypocrite. The reason for his efforts is so that he can capture the attention of who? Men. Right? So maybe when I see Pastor James praying, and then I, I try to pray louder than Pastor James to show that I am the next best thing in prayer. I have, hallelujah, become a hypocrite. What I'm doing, I am doing it because I want men to see me. Such an initiative does not strike any chord in the realm where the father is domiciled. Okay? Now, are you with me? Okay. Now, he said something very critical here that I also need to draw our attention to before we begin our journey. And the journey is twofold for tonight. Twofold. We need to consider two factors on how to texture your inner membrane in order for you to participate in God. So, now, second thing that is visible in that presentation is this fact. But before I mention it, I need to ask you a question. When, when, when you pray, what's your expectation? You, to be heard or to be answered? Oh. All right. We need to clarify these things. We will not assume that you know. Because we are trusting God that in the United Kingdom, prayer will become something that you find people doing on the streets again. That people will be led to Christ, kneeling down in the rain. On the streets. And it, yes, prayer will become customary, it will become common. Children will pray in tongues, and all kinds of things will begin to take place. Yes. 
we believe God for that. Now, most of us, when we pray, we pray so that we can be heard and also eventually answered. But you see, in what Jesus presents in this scripture, Jesus was not even talking about answers. The word that Jesus uses here is reward. Whereas you are looking for answers, God is looking for how to give you prayer rewards. The Bible says, call unto me and I will answer you. That's what you are seeking. So I will give you your answers. Then beyond your answers, and I will show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. You see, your contract, your participation of prayer uh, doesn't capture the other aspects that God is willing to give you. You came because you want answers. But God has designed us and designed life in such a way that you cannot but pray. And if you are foolish enough to accept to pray, he will give you your answers. Then he will invite you beyond your answers to show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Unfortunately, the hypocrite has no prayer reward. That's the problem with being a hypocrite because all he's doing is to become a spectacle in the eyes of men. So he's exempted from this blessing called prayer reward. That's number two. Did you get that? There are some blessings in the kingdom of God that is only open to intercessors, to prayer people. There are depths in God. When we begin to uh, trace all the metaphors that are in the New Testament that gives us an idea of the benefits and the powers of a prayer man, when we begin to talk about guardianship, which is a level of territorial responsibility and the attendant compliments that God by his mercy makes available because someone exercises the responsibility of guardianship in a territory, in a local assembly, in a family. When we go into that, you will now see that prayer is way beyond answers. There were many things hanging in the realm of the spirit that God is looking for an excuse to put on your life. When you become foolish enough to accept the, that we are being condemned to prayer and you begin to practice it, God will find you worthy of becoming a recipient of inheritances that are locked away in the heavenlies. That men are no longer interested in again. He will begin to uncover the treasury, the storehouse of grace. And he will begin to put on your life things that you never asked him. It says the hypocrite already has his reward. And because of that, uh, his reward is being seen by men. Now, it was after this that he now revealed to us the first quality of his father. Because if there is anybody that knows the father, it is Jesus. So if we want to explore who the father is, then we we'll need to study the Bible to find what Jesus said about his father. That is what is going to give us the insight into how to engage God. Are you there? Ask who? Father. So the first thing that Jesus says about his father is that his father is in secret. That's number one. It's in secret. We need to travel with two scriptures. In secret. If God wants to move in your life, he has chosen to move from your heart. So, if God wants to conquer your life, the first place he conquers is your heart. Your heart is an entry organ. Your heart is a love organ. 
your heart is the tarmac that God comes to run on if he wants to move on your life. And that's where God hides. If you are going to prosper in the prayer enterprise, then you must be someone that is conscious of the fact that God operates from the secret and the inward parts. And that's the heart. The secret and the inward parts. And because of this, are you, are you with me? Because of this, uh, I need to read the book of Matthew chapter 15 verse 8. Please put it on the screen for me. Matthew chapter 15 verse number 8. Where's the technical man? Matthew 15 verse 8. He said, these people, yeah? You took it away. Oh. It was, the scripture was showing on my screen and now it has vanished. All right, let me try to get it from my Bible. Matthew 15. Okay, it's back. He said, these people draw it nigh unto me with their mouth and honor it me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You see, that's that secret place. That's where God is. And um, unfortunately, the average believer is not conscious of the fact that God is in that secret place of your heart. If you are conscious of the fact that God is in that secret place, the way you order your life will matter. For instance, Potiphar's wife came to Joseph with a proposal. Lie with me. Potiphar was not there. There was no servant there. There was no way anyone would know that anything happened. Meanwhile, the Bible never revealed that Potiphar had any children. So it seemed to me that Potiphar was childless. And if Joseph should have something with Potiphar's wife, He's going to be in her good books and maybe she will recommend that he be adopted. He's going to have a good life. There were many more things for him to gain going with her than not to go with her. But you see, Joseph had something going with God and it was in the privacy of his heart. It was on the strength of that which was going, he had with God in his heart. He, he could not go with the woman because of what was going on where? In his heart. So he decided to be a victim of any weapon the woman was going to send at him because he wanted to preserve what he had going on where? There are some battles people bring to you. If you are conscious and if you, if you highly price that which you have with God in your heart, you will be willing to be called a fool. All right? Meanwhile, some people trample on your rights deliberately because they want you to react. But by reacting, you would have undermined what you have with him that is in secret. When we begin to take seriously the fact that we have something going on on our inside with God and that thing that we have going on with God regulates us such that we will refuse to fight for our rights sometimes because we see that there is a possibility of compromising what I have inside if I decide to fight. So I don't mind being called a fool so that I can keep what I have in secret. The Bible says that this our father who is in heaven, he's a God that is in secret. You know it is possible for someone to be saying something with his mouth but his heart is far away. He's in vain. The guys didn't know that he is in secret. That's the first thing. So there were fights. I refused to fight. Because I know if I fight, 
I will lose the tenderness with which I interface with him. Your heart is your treasure. How many of you have read the scripture that says keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life? Do you realize that because you have a brain, God had to make a skull to protect your brain? Because you have lungs, God had to make rib cages to protect your lungs and to protect your heart. Do you know that because of the sensitivity and the importance of your spinal cord, God had to create the vertebral column to protect it? The only thing God did not provide protection for is your heart. He says, you will be the security agency around it. Keep it, for out of it are the issues of life. I looked up the word issues in the Hebrew and check it. If you check it in the Hebrew for anybody that has an electronic Bible, you will find that the word issues is equal to boundary, boundary, geographical boundary. It means the state of your heart right now is what is responsible for where you are. Yes, your boundary in destiny is, is a function of the state of your heart. That's why if there's somebody here and you, you are deceptive in your heart and you believe that that's being smart, oh my God, that's why you are where you are. You have already defined your boundary that you cannot go beyond this point. That if you are going to go beyond this point, it will be by your, your skills, your wisdom, your, your, your smartness. That's a very poor way, a poor approach to life. It means you have no reinforcement from heaven. Heaven cannot recommend you. Oh my God, you are not in view whatsoever to being picked to become a functionary that God can depend on to fast track his agenda upon the face of the earth. Out of it, the Bible says, are the boundaries of life. When I found that, I began to decide not to fight. Let me be the fool before men. But I have something going on in my heart. And as long as that heart is still tender and adequately in alignment, I can pick things from heaven. I can get wisdom from the presence of God. I, 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 I will know what to do and how to get it done. I, I, in fact, things that have not even existed before, I can have ideas about them. My mind can become fruitful just because I have come to realize that the source of all things will be drawn from my intimacy with God. Prayer is an enterprise that you cannot do without your heart because if prayer doesn't affect your heart, it cannot change your life. Cannot. You just show up in the presence of God and you want to talk to God, then he reminds you how you shouted on your wife. So what he's saying is, make peace before you come back. That's when you will discover how difficult it is to say sorry. You will check your height first. <laughs> the flesh is terrible, the flesh. The fallen nature is terrible. But you see, if your heart is going to be ahead of your head, then you will need to follow those instructions that God will give you that will weaken your flesh weaken the power of the falling nature on your life so that the power of him that is resurrected that locks in your heart can take the lead that is the description of what it means to be a spiritual man so the first thing I want to bring to our notice is that the God our father is in secret I will tell you how to find him so that's the practical lesson the first practical lecture is how to find him that is in secret. If you want to find him always, you want to find him perpetually, when you quarrel with your wife, before you, you sleep, call her and say, you know, it's very difficult. What I'm telling you, <laughs> what, what, I'm telling you what I'm telling you is very difficult. If you need to close your eyes, close them and just say, 
for long, she will not know why you, why you behave like that. She will not know. She won't know that there's something you are trying to. She will think that suddenly love for her just came on you. <laughs> she won't know that there's something deeper than that that requires that you make peace. I dwell in secret. I am he that dwells in secret. That's number one. The second thing is that the Bible reveals that he also sees in secret. It, you know, it's possible for you to dwell in secret and see in the open. He dwells in secret and he sees also in secret. When God was educating Samuel on the prophetic, would be kings were standing before him and he, he looked at Eliab. Eliab, in terms of his physical structure, his height, the way he was built, his biceps, his triceps, he had the physique of a king. And Samuel was already making moves to empower him, to enthrone him. When God says, ah, your scale of measurement is faulty. I do not look at the outward appearance. So he was he's educating his man. I look upon the heart. So most times the when you see the, the people that God chooses for his assignments, when you look at them physically, they don't look it 100% of the times. For instance, I was born with facial palsy. I've never closed this eye before, and I was born in Tamara. And then the Lord said, I will preach his gospel. So my first question was, you created people that could talk and you came to me that cannot talk. And you are telling me to preach for you. And preaching is talking. I don't understand your logic. I come from a family of intellectuals. I mean a long line of intellectuals. So, and yeah, very sharp, very sharp, very sharp people. And among my immediate siblings, in terms of intellectual capacity, I'm not number one, I'm not number two, and I'm not number three, out of seven. <laughs> These guys are very, very sharp guys. All right, so why not pick? So when you look at them in the natural, they, they do not qualify to become what God is using them to do, not because it is not good for God to have an intellectual. But the way God chooses his people is according to his rating from the perspective of the heart. So some things may not make sense. They may not be logical. But the realm in which they make sense is from the realm of the heart. He said, do not look at the outward appearance. I have already rejected him. My analysis is done from the perspective of the heart. So it is you that tends your heart, that is willing to pay a price to maintain your alignment. It is you that God looks on and he says, this is my man. And, and you know that, are you there? As I round up, you know that it is possible for you to neglect your heart and then you are everywhere speaking in tongues so loud. And everybody is seeing you and say, oh, that sister has fire. Meanwhile, the heart is out of place. That is a description of a hypocrite that God is saying we should not become. Sometimes it's okay, I'm going, uh, I'm going on a dry fast. I don't know if you know what a dry fast is. Staying without food, you can drink water, but staying without food for 24 hours, for 48 hours, for 72 hours, because you want to seek the face of God. You know why some of those fasts take time 
It's because of your heart. God is trying to re-engineer your heart. It is totally out of alignment, totally out of sync. It has lost its calibration. The readings on the heart, they are wrong. And so they, they, there is God's, God deploys all the arsenal in his laboratory to begin to fix your heart. That's why the, the fasting took so much time before you could get feedback. All the strings were out of joint. He could no longer string your heart. He couldn't make a, 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 a definite note on the sound of your heart when it comes to try the reins. The sound was distorted. So he needs to walk there. Most of his walkings are in that place. Most of his dealings will come from that place. When you start becoming sensitive, he will drop an instruction. Go and give me this amount. And you can obey. Ah, it means you have made him your king. If you relate with him that governs your heart and you allow him to be king, your king, then your prayer will become powerful. Anyone that ignores his heart is praying for sport. And people that pray for sport, the Bible calls them hypocrites. What we are going to do in the next in the next 15 minutes is to find him that is in secret. There are so many things that you know, I read that scripture today, I read that scripture today. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Then I clicked on iniquity. And saw the long list of items, evil, unforgiveness, bitterness. What? So any man that is beginning to take prayer seriously has to go and run a check before God. Beam your light upon my heart so that I can see through your light and understand the state of my heart. You, you, you might have overrated yourself. Until the Lord decides to shed light upon your heart. Sometimes when you begin to pray, Lord, help me see my heart, help me see my heart, then it will create a, a situation. And then the way you will come with anger and curse, then he will say, because out of the abundance of the heart, the curse was there in the heart. All this while, you never knew. that You, were, you had cursing capacity to curse bitterly. It was the locking in the heart all this while. And you kept it for 18 years until an occasion came. God helped you and, and it came out. Then when you see what you are capable of, you go back to the closet and say, Ah! Lord! Yes. Except you become serious with your heart, you can't go far in the enterprise called prayer. So can we do some clinical adjustments of our hearts for the for the next 15 minutes, clinical adjustments. When we finish doing the clinical adjustments and we, we gain alignment as a congregation, I will let you know. I have a gift that can give me that signal. Then we'll try to look for the one that is hidden in a sacred place. You will now discover that even though he's in a sacred place, he's not hidden. You'll find out that even though you cannot see him, He's actually closer than your breath. And it's easier for you to know him much more than your physical wife. Can we do the clinical test for? Oh, you have, oh, oh, I have not given you the, I thought I did last time. We we'll call it heart therapy, heart check. It was David that in his prayer, he says, search my heart. He said, try me. If there be any wicked way in me, that's a man that is conscious of his heart and knows the protocol of heart therapy. The average believer is no longer concerned about that secret chamber. He overlooks it. He steps over it to go to work. Steps over it to, to use the train, the tube. And he forgets that that is the place that God will operate for 
if God wants to rise on his life, he will come from there. Search my heart. We'll do that for five minutes. Try me. If there be any wicked way me, you will need to put it aside. You need to reach out for the blood of Jesus so that alignment can be achieved. And when alignment is achieved, you will realize that it's easy to find him that is in secret. In a moment of time, let this moment be to you as it was for Adam when he was alone in the garden in the cool of the day. Make this your own moment alone as you talk to him and you speak to him concerning your heart. Concerning your heart. Concerning your heart. Because that's the secret place. That's where he operates from. You must be conscious of it. You must be deliberate about presenting it to him again and again and again and again every morning, every evening, every evening. Search my heart. Try my thoughts. Yeah. Then you will realize that everything that moves upon your heart, God is aware. The bitterness. The unforgiveness he is aware of it and it will stand as a stumbling block from allowing you gain entrance into that place called the secret place of the most high because the invitation to prayer is to dwell in the secret place of the most high it belongs to the most high but you can dwell there if you if you texture your heart if you are conscious of the inner chamber and you lay it before him again and again and again and the consciousness of the fact that you dwell in me will overwhelm my life so that my heart my life will derive from my heart i will hear your whispers i will obey your words thy word have i hidden in my heart that i might not sin against you that i might not contradict your authority i present my heart before you i present my heart afresh that from this day henceforth you will make me conscious of the fact that this is your chamber and every single day I will hand that heart to you to possess to take as your own to explore as you will to do as you please I surrender my heart again climb on it climb on it jump through it sing through it oh god in the name of jesus i know that you dwell in secret you dwell in secret but when you want to reward you reward in the open i pray tonight oh god as i bring before you my heart that you might beam your light upon my heart and uncover any darkness that sits therein in the name of Jesus oh we receive your blood Viva manse i cobras cufe la monde, a viga masquido bonde. Just like Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord that was falling, just like Elijah had to bring the stones together, just like Elijah had to fix that altar. That's what it means to fix your heart. That is the altar in the New Testament. That's where the fire of the Holy Ghost will come. That's where your life will be given as a sacrifice unto him. So tonight, can you repair that altar? Can you repair that altar right now? We fix that altar. A lot of transactions between earth and heaven will take place on that platform 
but we fix it tonight we fix it we fix it we bring the stones together we erect the altar fresh come holy god can you erect the altar afresh can you erect it afresh if there is anybody here you had a better prayer yesterday than the, you, your prayer life today you can fix the altar you can fix it you can bring the stones together again you can align it you can connect it to the heavens yes we build afresh we build afresh hey siko ba siko presko falame ai compania e so sede e capaus caprantelo e simo cosque sasananda a brasca tominanza i e campesa i capresco falama i capresco selimantelia asketo bonde we build afresh we raise the altar afresh we raise it afresh lord we receive the blood to cleanse us from the unforgiveness to cleanse us from the bitterness to cleanse us from anything in that place that does not glorify you we receive the blood right now because we want to build the altar afresh build my brothers and sisters build it for Elijah repaired the altar of God that was falling in the land He repaired the altar. Some of you started as mighty intercessors, warriors in the spirit. But the altar is falling. You can build again. You can build again. That intercessor line line on the bed can rise again that prophet can rise again your hearing has been affected your sight in the spirit has been affected but tonight you can rise you can build the altar you can align it again we come boldly we come boldly tonight we come boldly we come boldly tonight Hey! I don't want to faint. I don't want to be a fainting woman. I don't want to be a fainting man. I want to be a praying man. I want to be a praying woman. I will. I, oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! I want to be a man that can mount up with wings like the eagles into the heavenlies into Mount Zion to hear the voice of God to hear and to understand the mind of God oh I build I build the altar I build it again I build it again I build it again I build it again it's the place of transaction it's a place of visitation God will come and look upon the altar of your heart in the morning in the noon time and in the night confessimanatorie I am a catello, I casomenande, I cascambe socialia, a pala ma cascato bronde. I am a sico bambaia, rascato bonde samani, a vaico paladaia, I casembo in scola. Yes, we build, we build so that we can mount up with wings. We build so that we can run and not be weary. We build so that we can walk and not faint. 
grant, oh God, that the least among our numbers will become as strong as David in the name of Jesus. Oh, she come back, Makadia. Roseni, I'm a monsanto. I'm a monica gaw. I'm a monica car. Is I come Yes, the altar. The altar is being built. The altar is being built. It is. It is rising. It is rising.